OK. Let's get started. So yeah, today I'm going to be going through some ID and tropical medicine. Um, it's a pretty big topic, as you might have realised. Um, a lot of ideas like covered in other modules like pneumonia, um, gastroenteritis, things like that. Um, we're not going to cover everything. The focus is going to be slightly more on kind of tropical medicine and the approach. Um, so yeah, what we're going to go through. So a lot of ID and sort of tropical medicine is literally just like a buzzword game. You just need to quickly identify what it is from the question. Um, so we're going to have a, like, a quick um, matching up exercise, gastroenteritis, basically everything you need to know. Um, go through the approach to fever and the returning traveller briefly, because I think this is covered quite well. Um, malaria is probably the most important tropical disease to know about, so we'll go through that. And then the second half, there'll be a lot more kind of SBAs, um, have a picture quiz as well. Um, we've been through some infectious disease already, like meningitis, I think was the headache tutorial I did right at the start. I think other people have covered some bits and bobs, um, so do check those out. And as always, let us know in the feedback if there's anything specific you want to cover. I think a couple of people did ask for ID, hence we're going through it today. Um, so yeah, a quick starter, gastroenteritis. Sorry, this seems like a bit of a long list. This is basically like all the presentations you need to know. So if anyone wants to pop in the chat, um, can you match up any of these presentations to the organism? If we start relatively near the top, I can kind of show the answers as we go through. But let me know if you know any. So the top one's E. coli. Yeah, fab. So E. coli, most common cause of traveller's diarrhoea. Um, reheated rice, yeah, bacillus, serious. What about this one? Bloody diarrhea after a barbecue. It's Campylobacter. Yeah, brilliant. So, I know because I've had that. Oh, it's have bad. you? It's really bad. Oh, was it really nasty? <laughs> Terrible. Gosh. Okay. Yeah. Don't don't eat raw meats, everyone. Um. So what else have we got? C diff. Yeah, really good. Um, it's like your classic after a course of antibiotics. What about soft cheeses and milk? Is that listeria? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, really good. Listeria. Um, actually, this one might be slightly tricky. Well, chef, chef cut their finger. They might have mentioned in the question. And then the kind of key things like really rapid onset and diarrhea and vomiting as well. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, so, yeah, C. diff, like really classic after antibiotics. Does anyone know like any of the typical drugs um, that? might predispose you to see death because that's also like an SBA favourite. The Cipro one. Mm-hmm, Cipro is. And there's a Coamoxy as well. Oh. Yes, that is correct. Um, four Cs, I've got five Cs. I don't know which one was missing from your list, but yeah, <laughs> any antibiotics starting with a C. Um, also remember like PPIs, I know that's not an antibiotic, but um, that's also quite like a classic question. Um, yeah, Listeria, just think like milk, cheese, dairy products. Staph aureus. Um, I'm guessing this is to do with because it's like in the environment on the skin, um, so then it can get into food and it causes like this really acute onset, um, quick onset diarrhea and vomiting. What about the next few? This um, profuse rice water diarrhea. Anyone know? It's cholera. Mhm. Mm yep. Good. Um, this one's a bit tricky as well. Um, kind of niche. Number eight. OK, if I give a hint, um, it can sort of later... Bot 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 yeah, yeah, nice. So my hint was going to be that, um, like, after the gastroenteritis, it can cause, like, a descending paralysis from kind of head to toe, and it can be fatal if it like, involves the respiratory muscles. And they use the toxin from that in um, Botox. And number nine, so the green pea soup diarrhoea. OK, um, that is typhoid, so Salmonella typhi. Um, you can Google that if you like. I'd recommend not. It's pretty disgusting. Um, and then we've got two more. So like both quite a long history. But so 10 we've got um, including so they've been abroad traveling um, and they've got kind of malabsorption symptoms. So weight loss, loose, greasy, greasy kind of pale floating stools. Um, and then 11, we've got like a long history, HIV, um, low CD4 count. Anyone got any thoughts? 
I know Levin's crypto, right? So yeah, <laughs> so by process of exclusion. Um, ten is Jardia. Yeah, so um, Jardia is like a, a um, parasite, and those are kind of quite classic malabsorption. And yeah, HIV is definitely a fifth year topic, but I guess this is one way it could come up. Um, so yeah, cryptosporidium, HIV um, predisposes you to that. Cool, good work. Um, that's basically all the presentations you can get. Um, just a few kind of quick fire things. So causes of bloody diarrhea, we've mentioned Campylobacter. Anyone know any others? So the question might mention that the diarrhea was bloody and that could be a way of differentiating the cause. Shigella. Mm -hmm. Good. There's a strain of E. coli. Yep. Mm. IBD. Yeah, yeah, IBD. Sorry, I should have said like infectious causes diarrhea, but yeah, definitely IBD. Um, yeah, so E. coli. Yeah. yeah, 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 brilliant. Uh, e. coli can too, salmonella, and then it's Shigella and Yersinia. Um, Jardia, not typically bloody diarrhea. To be honest, like I'm sure anything could, um, but these are your kind of classic five to be aware of for questions. Um, and then if we talk about our causes of like rapid onset food poisonings, we mentioned Staph aureus. There's a couple of others. So this is like vomiting as well, and it happens after a few hours. Uh, bacillus serious. Yeah, um, very good. And also like all the viral causes, like norovirus and things. Um, yeah, so basically just remember that. Um, this, you probably don't need to know, but I found it quite helpful. Someone showed me this slide last year. So you get slightly different symptoms depending on where the information is, so whether it's in the large bowel or small bowel. If it's in the large bowel, just kind of think of like ulcerative colitis or something else that inflames the large bowel. You get, you know, blood, mucus, um, smaller volume of stool. You get tenesmus, which is also like one of the red flag symptoms for colorectal cancer. So that's the feeling of incomplete emptying. Um, you get urgency, lower abdominal pain too. And then with small bowel um, inflammation, it's kind of a more watery, larger volume. Um, you get things like bloating, um, flatus. So just think of like a disease that affects a small bowel too, like celiac or something, and you get these kind of similar symptoms. And the reason that's important is because you get slightly different um, causes depending on the symptoms. So it tends to be the bacteria. So we mentioned like our five causes of bloody diarrhea. These tend to cause um, a colitis and tends to be viral causes, things like norovirus that cause like a more watery, profuse diarrhea. Um, you probably don't need to know that, but could be of interest. And yeah, you can get a mix between the two. Um, these are like your key symptoms to ask in a gastroenteritis history um, and like your red flags as well. So treatment, um, I think it would be slightly mean to ask you about because to be honest we don't really do much it's generally supportive like you um just encourage the patient to take small sips of fluid throughout the day keep them rehydrated so nice recommends this oral rehydration salt solution um consider hospital admission like you don't need to know all this it's just kind of common sense if they're really unwell shocked really dehydrated not tolerating anything very vulnerable then you might want to consider admission we don't generally recommend anti-motility um, agents like loperamide um don't routinely prescribe antibiotics either. Um, I have seen in a couple of SBAs, um, like they do ask for an antibiotic for a really severe infection. The kind of only two I can recall are um, clarithromycin being for Campylobacter and Cipro for Salmonella. Um, this is also just from the NICE guidelines. But in general, you're not going to use antibiotics. OK, so I've got a couple of things from like the Amnesty, um, just sneaky UCL questions just to be aware of that are just kind of ridiculous. But um, anyone know what this? Um, bacteria is. So if I can convince you it's kind of spiral. Um, if I tell you as well, so they've had diarrhea, it's had some blood in it. Anyone got any guesses? H. pylori, um, good guess, not what I was thinking. Um, someone says Shigella, no, okay so I mean they're all good guesses, I don't see why you would know this unless you come across it, but if I can convince you it looks like that, um, this is Campylobacter. So just be aware if you see like a swirly bacteria, think Campylobacter. And you will get um, like a short history as well, so it's not just going to be a, an image. Um, what about this one? This I think it might have been taken from the amnesty. Amoeba, kind of close. Um, it's one that we've mentioned already. Again, if I tell you, it's kind of a long-standing history. It's a giardia. Yeah, really good. 
Uh, these are Giardia, so just like nothing else really looks like that, so just don't forget them. Um, they, they also call it like the smiley face sign. I think it looks more like a slightly creepy face, but um, that's Giardia, so you won't forget. Um, this I have seen a few questions on, so it's a, it's a protozoan infection. In general, like don't bother memorising the names of all these, but just be able to recognise them because the question might be like a two step question where it says the presentation and you have to pick what the organism is. So as long as you can just recognise them, that's fine. And like we said, um, just kind of a non-bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain, the malabsorption features are like the key thing for Giardia. So like the bloating, flatulence, pale floaty stools. A weird thing about this as well is it can lead to lactose intolerance. You might see in a question, which can last for like quite a few months after you've cleared the infection. But I think it generally resolves after. You don't need to know this, but for interest, you investigate it with, um, you just take stool samples because they're shed into the stool um, and you just do like microscopy and you see these guys. You can do PCR as well. Um, and then management, metronidazole. In general, if you're stuck and it's like a protozoal infection, I'd probably go with metronidazole. So use quite a few of these things. Um, okay, fever and the returning traveller. We'll just do this quickly because I think it's taught quite well on ID. But if I tell you, okay, so like it's an OSCE station, someone's come from abroad um, with fever, that's basically all you know. What do you want to ask, like in the travel history and what kind of things do you want to screen for? Exactly where they've come from. Yeah, brilliant, exactly where. So you want to know like the city, the country, where they stayed. Vaccination history, really important. So yeah, what vaccinations have they had? Did they take uh, the vaccines before going abroad that they should have done? So you can ask that in the drug history. Like what activities they were doing? They... Yeah, what activities are really, really good. Someone else is saying something? Um, if they were living with loads of people in a, like a hostel or something. If they were yeah, surrounded by yeah, so what sort of accommodation did they stay in? Really important too. Anything else? Yeah, when do they return? Because all these different diseases have different incubation periods. If they went swimming in lakes or things like that. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Because that will come under activities, like just have a few things to ask about. Like, have they done freshwater swimming? Have they, um, actually, we'll go through it in a sec. But yeah, really good stuff, guys. So the travel history, where did they go? You want to be really specific. What country, what city? Was it a rural area? Like, were they camping? Was it an urban area? Were they staying in a hotel? Um, this thing about visiting friends and relatives is also really important because, um, in general, people that visit friends and relatives rather than staying in a hotel um like the stats have shown that they take away like way less people take um, their malaria prophylaxis um and they're also at risk of sort of other infections that might be endemic um because often people that were brought up somewhere where malaria was quite um endemic then like come somewhere say the uk and then go back home they think they're um they've got resist like immunity but they don't really because it kind of wears away over time so that's really important um when so when exactly did they um, go on holiday and when did they come back and then you can sort of have a bit of a time frame to work with what did they do so activities things you can ask about water-based activities um like in fresh water did they go hiking they might like in woodlands they might have been bitten by um, insects so they come into contact with any animals um again this is slightly more fifth year but for things like hepatitis and hiv did they get any tattoos piercings inject anything um Again, I don't think you're really expected to take a sexual history at all, but you could just ask, um, are you sexually active um, when you're away? In, were they aware of any insect bites? Um, do they injure themselves in any way? If they've got breaks in the skin, they might have something like a cellulitis. Um, were they unwell when they were away or was it, you know, when they came home? And if so, like what happens when they were abroad? Um, I don't think anyone mentioned food and drink, also important. So did they eat like local street food? Did they eat any kind of weird meats? Um, on pasteurised milk? Do they have bottled water or tap water? It might be contaminated. Um, you know, was anyone else that they were travelling with unwell? Anyone they stayed at unwell? Um, you would then go and do your normal, you know, past medical history, family history, whatever, just quickly screen for that. And then under the drug history, someone said like the vaccinations, but also do they take their malaria prophylaxis if they went to an endemic area? Um, yeah, and do they take it as they should have done? Um, really good stuff. Like it's pretty... Um, just think of it as like things you'd ask their friend when they come back from holiday. Like it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then 
again, so I, I don't think you're just going to get like a fever and nothing else that's really harsh. But just to be aware, you always in any history ask red flags, you know, fever, weight loss, night sweats. And then if you're ever unsure in a situation like this, literally just go through a review of systems. So for an infection, if someone's got a fever, you know, is it a respiratory cause? Um, cause have they got, you know, cough, like pneumonia symptoms? If they, they got like a gastroenteritis, you know, diarrhea, constipation, vomiting, um, could they have had a UTI? Um, like very rare, but you know, meningitis. Um, have they got a weird rash? Yeah, just go through a review of systems. And then, so everyone can have a go at what sort of investigations if someone's come back with a fever, or even if you're just working in A&E and there's a fever and you don't know, you know what's caused it, what investigations might you want to consider? You could do urine dip at the bedside for a UTI. Yeah, great. Always your in dip. Anyone got any other thoughts? Basic odds at the bedside as well. Yeah, yeah, really good. Always just like pad your answer out with that if you don't know. Um, but I don't know if it's, I mean, COVID swab, I guess, but it's probably done yeah. anyway. That's really good. I should have written specifically that. Um, yeah, yeah, great stuff. So um, again, it's going to depend on what symptoms they've come in with. If they've got like diarrhea, even do a stool sample, urine dip, like we said, swabs, I should have written COVID one specifically. But yeah, um, throat one from any lesions. These are just sort of general things to bear in mind. You're not going to do all these for everyone, but your routine bloods, you know, always FPC using these LFTs. Here you would do CRP, blood cultures. Um, the one thing about like fever is just be aware of an HIV test. I know, I know this again, that's a fifth year topic, but that can predispose you to a bunch of infections. Imaging, you know, if they've got chest symptoms, you want to do a chest X-ray. If they've got you know, jaundice, you might want to do an ultrasound to the liver or spleen. Um, and then special tests for someone coming back from abroad. You always want to do your, um, we'll talk about them in a sec, but like your malaria, thick and thin blood films. Um, and then there's, you know, your serology or whatever for specific diseases. Um, cool. So just a kind of note on ID, sort of coming up with the differential, because I think it can be really tricky. There's so, so many like weird and wonderful infectious diseases that could be causing fever. Um, and I think it can be quite an overwhelming topic. But in general, like what UCL, at least in an OSCE is going to ask you about is only common things. You know, pneumonias, upper respiratory tract infections, maybe a UTI or gastroenteritis. You're not going to get like one of these weird tropical diseases. Um, it's like an OSCE station. So it's more just an SBA thing. And it literally is just a game of buzzwords. You don't need to know all that much about any of them. It's just being able to rule things out and you know work out what it is. For a few, you might need to know the management. But um, yeah, it literally is just a matter of doing SBA. So like the past med bank's really good for that. Um, one key point, so in any returning traveler presenting with a fever, what is the infectious disease that we must always rule out? Malaria. Yeah, good, yeah. TB as well is definitely going to be up there. That's a really important one. But the kind of rule that UCL kind of hammer in um, on ID, at least for me, was just to always rule out malaria and fever in the returning traveller. Cool. So let's go. So on. So why is there that special attention for malaria? I think it's just so common. And, you know, like we have drugs to treat it. All the other tropical diseases are like kind of rare. Um, yeah, I guess because it's just got potentially like really bad consequences really quickly. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, okay. But yeah, I think it's just to do with how, how common it is. Um, cool. So we're going to talk a bit about malaria and then I've got a bunch of SBAs on some other things. Um, I probably shouldn't have said that because I might have given this away slightly, but we've got an SBA for you. So yeah, just pop answers in the chat or let me know what you think. Got one for B. Anyone else agree, disagree? B, more Bs. Cool. Good stuff. Um, yeah, so like we just said, always want to rule out malaria and fe um, fever in the returning traveller. And the way we do this is thick and thin blood films. So this is like our most important initial investigation. And there's also loads of um, symptoms of malaria, which we'll talk about in a sec, like um, this fever that comes and goes in cycles, um, myalgia, just like 
you get um kind of chills as well and sweating just up and down um you get high bilirubin sorry I should have put a normal range in um because you get hemolysis of red blood cells we'll talk about all that but yeah good stuff um something that some people wonder about is do you need to know um where does the thick and thin mill aha we'll talk about that in a sec um good question um so something at least I was wondering you know do you need to know where all these different tropical diseases are in the world because in questions you know they'll give you a country and so on I would say as a general rule no except for know where malaria is um and potentially like hepatitis is a really big one but only like the really important conditions um I may or may not have seen a question um a year ago where it was quite a non-specific presentation that could have potentially been malaria could have potentially been hepatitis and thankfully I knew sort of where malaria was endemic so I could work out the answer um but yeah I never said that um so yeah malaria is kind of sub-Saharan Africa is your big one but also you know Asia Central America South America um oh. What's happened here? So what causes it? So the vector um, is the female Anopheles mosquito, um, which tends to, bre to breed in less urban areas, so in more rural areas. And it's a um, protozoal infection, so it's the plasmodium species. And there's five different ones. Um, so the most important one to know is falciparum malaria. Um, the others you don't really see so much. So no lessi, ovale, vivax, malariae. Also apologies for my pronunciation of all these infectious diseases definitely wrong um but yeah so presents pretty non-specifically um you know flu-like symptoms you get these fevers and chills you know feeling a bit rough headaches diarrhea nausea and vomiting all very non-specific but some things that definitely point to malaria is you can get this really um like weird fever that comes and goes in cycles so it's related to the rupture of the schisms i think you meant to call them so you're going to see this horrible looking life cycle and do not bother um, learning this but if you kind of want to understand why you get the symptoms it can help so ignore the mosquito stages just looking at the humans what happens when the mosquito kind of inject takes a blood meal so it injects the sporozoite how do you say that which are like the parasites into the human and it goes straight to the liver cells in fact the liver cells um you grow these kind of schizonts which rupture um and that causes some symptoms and when that's in the bloodstream, it can then go and infect red blood cells. Exact same thing happens, grows into these schisms and they rupture. So when you get rupture of the, um, okay, so, yeah, key points. So it's the liver cells and the red blood cells that are infected. And when you get rupture of these schisms, you get a fever, just all the inflammation. And when you get rupture of red blood cells, you get um, jaundice and anemia because you get um, hemolysis. That's basically all you need to know about that. Um, yeah, so you get this cyclical fever because the schisms, which are like maturing in the red blood cells um, and the liver cells, they take different kind of lengths of time to mature in the different species. And that's why you get these fevers that come and go in cycles. So um, I think this again will be quite mean, but potentially worth knowing. So that um, Vivax and Ovale, um, you get this tertian fever. So it happens every 48 hours. What that means is every third day they have a fever with Plasmodium malariae it's quartan so every fourth day they get a fever and falciparum is quite irregular um up to you whether you want to learn that and then yeah from hemolysis for blood cells you get anemia you get jaundice cool um oops oh well um diagnosing malaria actually i'm just going to talk through this anyway because we kind of know this we've been through it so as always obs blood glucose is a really important investigation in malaria because you can get a hypoglycemia um urinalysis as well like just remember we don't we're trying to work out what the cause of the fever is here so you want to do all your normal tests to monitor the urine output because they can get shocked bloods you know your normal fecs knees lfts your inflammatory markers your blood cultures for an infection a couple things important for malaria you want to do a clotting because they can get dic um so disseminated intravascular coagulation is a horrible complication and again they can get acidosis they can get hypoglycemia so a vbg is a good test as well um and then someone's asking me about, um, Ikra was asking me about thick and thin blood films. So this is the diagnostic test. And this is literally what it looks like. You just take blood, you have a big blob on one side and a much thinner smear on the other side. And the thick smear, the purpose of that is to see the parasites. So you've got loads and loads of red blood cells here. And the microscope, looking down the microscope, you can just see whether or not there's parasites in any of the cells. The thin smear, you've got like way less layers of red blood cells, so you can get a more precise view. 
this is to work out what species it is like this is just for your reference but um you can see under the light microscope that all the species look kind of different so that's what the fin smear is for i hope that answered your question let me know if not and you do these serial um what's it called blood films so you want to repeat them a few times because you really don't want to miss malaria so you repeat it at 12 hours after 24 hours after another 24 hours um if so three is the magic number so if three films are, ne are negative really unlikely to be malaria um again like kind of rogue you don't need to know this but you can get this rapid diagnostic test as well um which gives you really quick results um it's very expensive but like if no experts are available um and you're suspicious you can do that Cool, let me know if there's any questions or I'm aware I'm kind of rattling through. Um, oh, wasn't meant to do that either. Oh well, <laughs> I'm really not good at animations today. Okay, management. So anyone with malaria, you want to admit, and it's a notifiable disease, so you need to notify Public Health England. Okay, and anyone know what the management is for falciparum malaria? This is one of the tropical diseases you do need to know management for. Chloroquine. Yeah, so chloroquine is used for non falciparum malaria because where this um, kind of species is, there's a lot of chloroquine resistance, but really good that you know that drug. So, um, yeah, ACT, perfect. So, just learn whatever's in bottles, don't bother about all this. But so for moderate falciparum malaria, you give um, artemisinin based combination therapy. What that means is an artemisinin drug and another drug. These things like artesne, artemetha, um, don't bother learning names. But yeah, so that's moderate malaria. If it's severe, and we'll talk about what um, classifies as severe in a sec, they need to go to ITU and you need to give them IV drugs, so IV artesanate. And when they're a bit more stable, you just step it down and you give them the ACT. Cool. For non falciparum malaria, um, you can use ACT and you can alternatively give chloroquine, uh, just like Nadia said. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's a lot of resistance to chloroquine. So non falciparum is any of the other species. There's a slight exception as well for Vivax and Ovale. You give chloroquine and you also give primaquine. Um, I think the reason for this is that, um, so the chloroquine like kills any of the kind of available parasites that it can reach. But in Vivax and Ovale, you get these dormant parasites that just stay in the liver, ce liver cells for a while. So the primapine comes along and kills all of those. Sorry, that was a bit of a mouthful. But yeah, worth learning the things in bold. Um, and let me know if you've got any questions. Till then, um, another SBA. Is that chloroquine the same as the hydroxychloroquine you give for one of the room conditions? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I wouldn't have thought so, but yeah, possibly. I mean, why else would it be called that? Um, someone can have a Google and let me know. <laughs> I have no idea. It's a good question. Seems rogue getting an anti-malarial sort of room condition, but I'll yeah. search it up. Cool. Thanks. Anyone got any thoughts? This vomiting. Vomiting. Someone's gone for vomiting. Another uh, vomiting. She like the that you're in. I reckon I'll close this, but that's just. Oh, I'm okay. Okay, nice, cool. Got a mix of answers. Um, at least everyone's going to learn something today. Um, so the answer is a parasitemia of 3.2%, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, so you don't get hyperglycemia in severe severe malaria. You give hypoglycemia. Yeah, and sorry, the IV is for severe malaria rather than oral for moderate. Uh, you don't get an alkalosis, you get an acidosis. And no, his girlfriend has a fever is not going to impact your decision. So features of severe malaria. Um, again, like once you've kind of seen the list once, it's quite intuitive. But again, like I unfortunately have seen questions on this. Um, so a parasitemia level of more than 2%. What that means is when you're looking down the microscope at the red blood cells, do more than 2% of them have the parasites in? So that's why our um, question was the hypoglycemia. Um, I think it like impairs gluconeogenesis, um, acidosis. I think you get like hypoxia to tissues. If you've got a temperature above 39, severe anemia, um, the schizons on the blood film, 
Should have got a picture of in a sec. And if you develop any complications of malaria, so cerebral malaria, like if your brain's affected, obviously that sounds quite severe. Um, you know, lactic acidosis. You can get a renal fa uh, failure, so this nasty black water fever due to hemolysis, and your urine literally turns black because of all the hemoglobin in it. You can get acute respiratory distress syndrome (DIC). Um, yeah, so j just be aware of those. Um, having read them, hopefully you remember some. Uh, these are what the um, schizonts look like on a blood film, you know, just the kind of parasites maturing in the um, liver and red blood cells. And then that's just a picture of what the parasite actually looks like. So if more than 2% of erythrocytes have these in, that's a uh, severe malaria. Cool. So now enough of malaria, I've got some, a bunch of other SVAs from other tropical diseases. So again, let me know your answers when you've had a think. So Basil's gone for B. Anyone else agree or disagree? Yeah, Nadia agrees. Okay, nice work. Yeah, really good stuff. This is leptospirosis, and you could have read all that, but you could have just seen that they had red conjunctiva, which only really happens in leptospirosis. Um, so we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so we're going to talk about schistosomiasis later. We just spoke about malaria, um, yellow fever. Well, firstly, you can have like a pre-travel vaccination for yellow fever, but it doesn't cause um, these red conjunctiva and Lyme disease. It's caused by like a tick bite, which we'll also talk about later. Um, so, yeah, again, it literally is just a buzzword game. So this guy had a uh, red conjunctiva um, and he was in the pool. So there's lots of kind of um, water around as well. So leptospirosis, a wild disease caused by this um, bacteria. Um, so the kind of classic history is like a sewage worker or someone around dirty water. Um, so it can spread an infected rat urine. Um, just learn the things in bold. So, so you can get this kind of flu-like symptoms, but the key thing is you get this subconjunctival suffusion or hemorrhage, which looks pretty dramatic. I think this picture literally is on the amnesty. Like they always ask about it in um, fifth year as well. Oh, it is used for lupus treatment, hydroxychloroquine. No idea why, neither. Um, that's interesting, I learned something new. Um, yeah, so this is what the subconjunctival hemorrhage looks like. And if you see that, you're thinking uh, leptospirosis. Just remember also, so hepatorenal, so it can affect the liver and it can affect the kidneys. That's about all you need to know. Um, don't really need to know this, but you diagnose it um, with antibodies, which can appear after about seven days and you give doxycycline. Um, cool, next SBA. A big hint for this one is if you see like Lake Malawi, um, like I could honestly just guarantee you the diagnosis anyway, because it always seems to be in the stem. But has anyone got any thoughts? Or if you don't know what the treatment is, any thoughts about what might be going on? I think it might be schistosomiasis, but I don't know how to treat that. Yeah. You know, so you're definitely right um, with the diagnosis. So it's just a smysis, um, which you treat with um, praziquantel, which is like an anti-helmintic, I think, because um, it's like a, a worm, a flatworm infection. Um, and you also give steroids. So you give steroids because you tend to get like a hypersensitivity reaction with schisto. So they can get high eosinophils, they can get like an urticarial rash, is just like an itchy allergic rash. 
Um, so you steroids for that part, and then to kill the actual worms, um, you give praziquantel, which like paralyzes the, the worms. So because it's a kind of parasitic worm infection, you're not going to give an antibiotic. Um, another antibiotic, you're not going to do that. This C is the treatment for syphilis, which you don't need to know. Um, but you're not going to give an antiviral either, and you're not going to give malaria treatment because it's not malaria. Um, so yeah, great stuff. Um, sorry about all, all the pictures, by the way. I got a bit carried away when I was making this. Um, so it's just a smiosis, um, is a parasitic flatworm. And it's like the snail um, is the vector for it. And these are in freshwater lakes. And if you see Lake Malawi in a question, most likely it's just a smiosis. Um, cool, so again, just be aware of the things in bold. So at the site of penetration of the flatworms, you can get this really itchy papular rash. So it's called a swimmer's itch. Looks like that. Um, you get this kind of acute syndrome with a bunch of symptoms, but the key things, like I said, are these kind of allergic hypersensitivity symptoms. So you get high eosinophils, you get urticaria, so itchiness, and you get angioedema, like a kind of hypersensitivity reaction around the lips with this horrible swelling. Um, the other key thing to note is just it increases your risk of bladder squamous cell uh, carcinoma. Um, yeah, don't bother learning the rest. And then the management I have seen as well, so corticosteroids and praziquantel. I have a stupid question. Um, no questions. The, the photo, is that the, the papular rash? Yeah, sorry, ignore all my snails. And the how, how would people rash. not notice that there were like snails stuck to their back? Is that yeah, not something they'd mention in history? Yeah, so, so the snails are the vector. I don't know exactly what happens in the snail, but it's actually this um, tiny, probably microscopic flatworm that actually is what penetrates your skin and causes the infection. I'm guessing it's like the snails that kind of transmit them somehow. Um, yeah, so you, yeah, it's not, you, you don't need like the snails to be on you. You just need to be in water where the snails have passed this flatworm. Does that help? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, I should have explained that a bit better. Um, nice, next SBA. We've got one A. Another A. Another A. Cool. Good stuff. You guys are right. Again, literally just buzzwords. So this is dengue fever, um, which is caused by mosquitoes. So note the insect bite. And the key kind of features here, so you get a retroorbital headache, so pain behind the eyes. So if they describe that, you're thinking dengue. Um, you get, so that they call it a bone breaking fever, because you can get a fever and you get this really, really severe joint pain. Um, so if you literally just remember mosquitoes, retroorbital headache and bone breaking fever, then you know it's dengue. You get low platelets as well. I think the virus somehow causes them to clump and die, don't really know, and raised ALT. Um, so yeah, dengue fever is a viral infection. It's from the class of infections called like viral, viral hemorrhagic fevers. So the other ones are like yellow fever, Lassa fever, Ebola. Um, so the vector, again, just mosquito. Complications to be aware of. Um, Actually, you really don't need to know this, just for your interest. Um, so you can get like a dengue hemorrhagic fever, so a form of DIC, and it can progress, I don't know how, to the other viral hemorrhagic fevers. So these, um, yeah, I don't know what I was going to say. Um, supportive management, you can't really do much about it. Again, let me know if there's any questions. So next we're going to Tanzania. I just put these pictures in because my friend was there recently for elective and it looked really nice. Um, making me jealous. Cool. So next question. Yeah, they're getting a bit hard now, sorry. <laughs> That's some key learning points. And if you don't know the, diag um, the answer, do you know the diagnosis or what the sign is? Got one for D. Anyone else agree or disagree or don't know? Yeah, um, 
Are they rose spots? Yes, they are. And we've got one for B. Um, this is hard. The answer is D. And yes, these are rose spots. So this is typhoid fever. Um, and yeah, it's not a very good picture, but this is what these rose spots are like, look like. Um, and you remember we talked, so that's spread by Salmonella typhi, and we had right at the start in the gastroenteritis, that can cause diarrhea, but it can also cause this really horrible constipation. Um, and it was the pea green soup diarrhea. So this is another picture of rose spots. You can see they kind of vary from person to person. Um, so Salmonella typhi, also paratyphi, uh, spread fecal orally. Um, again, just here, key thing, it causes constipation, um, abdominal pain. And then, so about 40% of people get these rose spots on a trunk, and they'll probably give you those in an SBA because it helps you to differentiate what's going on. And uh, some people can also get a bradycardia, like the question was asking. So that was quite a mean question. I don't think you need to know this, but you treat it with um, fluoroquinolone, so like ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin. Sorry, is this different to the salmonella you get from eating raw chicken? Um, I th think it's the same. Um, the same. Okay. I think Salmonella typhi causes that. Maybe it's the paratyphi that causes the more constipation picture. I don't actually know. Um, but yeah, it's the same organism, right? I think. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Um, yeah, sorry, guys. If you ask me questions beyond <laughs> what is sort of on these SBAs, I can't guarantee I know. Like, tropical medicine is just vast. Um, but yeah, I think it is. Okay, next, let's talk about rabies. Um, so... Rabies is a nasty disease, so causes an acute viral encephalitis, so that like inflammation of the brain parenchyma, and transmitted by um, animals, so typically like dogs, bats, also things like raccoons, skunks, foxes, um, and the animals that are kind of infected will often show really strange behaviour, um, like they might be quite aggressive, um, bats which are nocturnal might be out during the day. Um, so yeah, key features of rabies. So you can get like a prodrome, just general, you know, headache, fever, get quite agitated. One really um, unique thing about it is you get this hydrophobia, which is a fear of water. I've linked in the notes to the slide <clears throat> a video from the Lancet of like a kid that's got rabies and his mum shows him a cup of water and he's literally terrified, like it's crazy. Um, and you can also hypersalivate um, like this guy's doing. And the really important thing is to treat it quickly because you've got like it could be one month to three month window period between when they get bitten and when these neurological symptoms appear. And once you've got these neurological symptoms, like the hydrophobia and all that, it's fatal. There's nothing you can do. But if you treat it really quickly, you can. So try this SBA. We've got one for D. D, D. Yeah. Good stuff. Sorry, I should have waited a bit longer. D, D. Nice. Cool. Well done, everyone. So um, he needs both because he has never been immunized. Um, so he needs the human rabies immunoglobulin and also vaccination. Um, he doesn't need antibiotics because rabies is caused by a virus and you don't really use them any. And, um, but anyway, um, and yeah, he needs to urgently seek medical help. Like we said, you need to treat before you get the neurological symptoms. So rabies, first thing to do, oh, don't know what happened there. Wash the wound um, as you would for any wound. Treat before the neurological symptoms. If the person's vaccinated, you give two further doses of vaccine. If they're not vac vaccinated, like our person in this SBA, um, you give the human rabies immunoglobulin and you give a full course of vaccine, which I think is three doses. Um, and that's it. It's pretty simple. Again, interrupt me if there's any questions. So what I really want to go here looks so nice. The Rockies for our next question. Um, have a read. Again, this is quite tricky. Um, it's like a multi-step one. So if you're not sure of the answer, but know what condition it is, let me know as well. Is this yellow fever? Uh, it's not yellow fever, but good guess. Okay, so we've got some A's. A's, acyclovir. 
Okay. And does anyone know what the condition is? Yeah, it's Lyme's disease. Yeah. Yeah, well done everyone. Um, so the correct answer was A. Um, and yeah, this is Lyme disease, which you treat with um, a tetracycline, uh, doxycycline, and this is a side effect of tetracycline. So, oh dear, what's going on there? Um, so Lyme disease, remember this organism, because it doesn't sound like the name of the condition. Um, so Borrelia, just remember that, spread by tick bites. And it presents with this erythema migrans, so this kind of bullseye rash. Um, and just be aware that like the erythema isn't as obvious on slightly dark skin tones. Um, again, key things, so fever, myalgia, arthralgia, fatigue. You can also get these weird like facial nerve palsies, um, carditis, encephalopathy. Um, and the key thing is just doxycycline, just be aware of that. And then um, if there's, you know, cardiac or neurological complications, you give slightly different antibiotics. You give IV keftriaxone or keftaxine. Um, important tetracycline side effects. So we said one was photosensitivity. Um, do you guys know any of these other signs? Is that like that carry tongue and then like um, browning or yellowing of the teeth? So like skin. Yeah, it's really good. So yeah, that's black hairy tongue. These are called tetracycline teeth. Um, so nausea and vomiting. If you're ever asked about the side effect of a drug by like a consultant, just always say a, like GI upset because it's always right. Um, photosensitivity, like we said, this black hairy tongue looks pretty awful. Um, angioedema of the lips. So this kind of lip swelling. Um, that's what we got in um, schistosomiasis, like hypersensitivity reaction. It looks like this. It can be even worse, just swollen lips. Um, and then tetracycline teeth. So if you give it to pregnant women, um, their babies can grow up with tetracycline teeth um, and don't give it to young children as well. So what's the time? OK, we're doing quite well time. This hopefully will be a bit quicker. Um, got a picture quiz. So I'm going to give you this. In the meanwhile, I'm just going to post the feedback link in the chat if anyone has to dash off. So it would be great to get some feedback. HSV1. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, OK, but if with <laughs> I didn't word this so well either. You're definitely right that it's herpes simplex virus that's going to cause this. But if it's someone with a kind of pneumonia type picture, like the person's got here, um, what are we thinking? Strep pyogenes, what's the feedback? Um, so, very close, it was strep pneumonia. Um, yeah, bell has got that. Um, so, in, so streptococcus pneumonia is the most common cause of a cap, um, community acquired pneumonia. And it's the one where you get that like rusty sputum and you can also get um, cold sores, so herpes labialis, because um, you can get reactivation of HSV when you have this. So if someone's got a pneumonia and a cold sore, you're thinking streptococcus uh, pneumonia. Cool. What about this one? Mycoplasma, erythema marginatum. Yeah, really good. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was erythema multiforme. Erythema marginatum looks really similar. I can't actually remember what the difference was. Um, but yeah, really close. And it's mycoplasma pneumoniae that's the organism. So again, if you've got someone with a pneumonia type picture and this rash, we're thinking mycoplasma pneumoniae. Um, I think I saw someone told me like remember miserable because they've, they've got flu symptoms um which can get really bad so miserable mycoplasma multiforme um and yeah it's an atypical cause of pneumonia this is potentially more of a fifth year topic i think but could come under the kind of skin infection part of id so what is the diagnosis just based off this We've got impetigo. Yeah, impetigo is correct. Um, so it's described as these honey crusted and um, like lesions and blisters. 
So particularly affects young children who might have breaks in the skin, like if they've got eczema around the mouth or whatever on the face. Um, and then you can get the superimposed um, Staph aureus infection, which causes impetigo. And it's really, really infectious. So these kids can't be sharing towels with anyone. Um, and you use topical treatments. So like, this is definitely fifth year, but um, you give like a hydrogen peroxide cream. And then if that doesn't work, you can use a topical antibiotic cream. Um, yeah, <laughs> trigger warning, there's some feet. So look away if you don't like gross feet. Um, this I, I saw once on a um, question, like, I think this is very hard. Um, this is kind of spot diagnosis. Does anyone know? Fungal infection, it most definitely is. And if I told you um, that, okay, this might happen in someone who's not got the best foot hygiene, they've not been washing between their feet after doing lots of sports and sweaty socks. Is it athlete's foot? Yes, it is indeed. Um, so it's also called ringworm, and when it's on the feet, it's called um, tinea pedis. That is very hard. Um, so yeah, really good stuff. Looks pretty awful. Oh yeah, don't look. <laughs> don't look again if you don't like feet. This one's also pretty gory. This I think I might have also seen um, on like the Amnesty or someone from an old year might have mentioned it. And again, yeah, this is quite hard. So Joanna's gone for Staph aureus. Um, I was also gone for Staph aureus. Staph aureus is a really good guess, actually, because like that is a really common cause of you know, skin infections and it's on um, our skin as well. But the key thing about this, if you can tell, it's kind of pale green in colour. Um, and the other key thing is that this man probably has a neuropathic ulcer. Um, so someone's got it um yeah Nadia said pseudomonas yeah really good so this is again just like a spot diagnosis you don't need to know anything more about it but pseudomonas causes this kind of pale green nasty looking um ulcer um sorry infection on top of um what's a neuropathic ulcer so the, the hints that this man has some peripheral neuropathy is he didn't know this ulcer was there like there's this boring hole on his foot and he couldn't feel it so he's got reduced pain sensation and um, he's been tripping over a lot um again just like peripheral neuropathy and diabetes is really common um and yeah it can absolutely stink and it's just green and disgusting so if you see a green also on someone um who's got diabetes in an sba think pseudomonas um this is much more common so we've got a quincy we've got a diphtheria Okay, so I think much, much more common than diphtheria. I see where you're going with that, though. Um, strep. So strep is the most likely um, cause of this. Yeah, strep pyogenes. What What is the actual like likely diagnosis if you're seeing this at the back of someone's mouth? Tonsillitis. Yeah, <laughs> tonsillitis. I'll put this in because I'm on GP at the moment. I've seen like 10 of these this week. Um, this is tonsillitis. Okay, and very sba -able. when would you give antibiotics? Is it based off the Centaur criteria? Yes, it is based off the Centaur criteria. Does anyone know any of the Centaur criteria? I know one of them is absence of the cough. Mm -hmm. Correct. That was the one that I knew when my GP was quizzing me on this this week and I had no idea. Um, yeah, so that the central criteria indicates that it's a bacterial cause, a viral. Um, no cough, cervical lymphadenopathy, fever. Brilliant. Yeah, perfect. So if you have at least three of these, you give antibiotics. So fever, tonsillar exudates, which are these nasty pussy things which you see on examination, um, cervical lymphadenopathy, and no cough. Um, and the really good thing is like over remote consultation, you can literally ask about like fever, do they have like pus at the back of their mouth and do they have cough? Like parents might not be able to feel like lymphadenopathy on their kids, but you can basically just prescribe antibiotics based over what someone's typed on the e-consult. Um, and then what is the antibiotic that we give? 
And someone mentioned Quincy as well, um, which is like a complication of tonsillitis. So definitely be aware of that. And in Quincy, you do you get deviation of the uvula, uvula, but it's going to be like completely to one side and you have a massive tonsil on one side and you get that like hot potato speech and things. But yeah, really good guess. What's the antibiotic? It is a type of penicillin. It's not benzyl penicillin. It's not amoxicillin. You could use these things to be fair, but there's like one that um, it's like a set, it's one of those conditions where there's a set antibiotic that you will almost yeah. always give. SMMZ. Yeah. <laughs> it will come for like every other type of penicillin. Yeah. So it's um, penicillin B, also called phenoxymethyl penicillin. Um, and you give like a seven to 10 day course of this if they have three or more central criteria. So know that one. Um, got a few more slides, nearly done. I think we'll be done by five past. So um, who was it? Someone knows the answer to this, kind of. <laughs> Someone literally said this before. Do you know what the diagnosis is? Yes, uh, diphtheria. Yes, it is. Um, this is diphtheria. It looks so weird. I think it looks like like bubble gum stuck at the back of the mouth or something. But it's diphtheria um, caused by this bacteria. And what, like the only thing you need to know is you get this grey coating on the tonsils. Um, so you can remember it. I remember diphtheria. They're like tonsils dipped in grey. And that's what it looks like. Um, another kind of spot diagnosis. Um, also quite hard, but potentially SBAable. Sorry, what's the condition was the, the question. Leprosy. Correct. So this is leprosy. Um, again, just be aware of the, the names of the organisms where it doesn't sound exactly like what it is. Um, so in leprosy, you get skin hypopigmentation, which you can see here, and you can get sensory loss and like thickened nerves, and that's about all you need to know. Um, and it's endemic in India, Indonesia, and Brazil, I think, of like three main countries. That was a hint, although you wouldn't be expected to know that at all. But yeah, just sensory loss and skin hyperpigmentation. Okay, this, what is the condition here? And again, this is like a spot diagnosis that I'm sure you've all seen plenty of. It's like COVID. Yes, this is very much COVID. Um, don't forget the chest x-ray. Like I've seen so many of them on the wards. I think it's probably a lot less of a problem now, thankfully. But just these crazy kind of opacities. Um, yeah, I think COVID like technically is on our syllabuses, syllabi. Um, I don't really know. I don't think they would ask about management and things of COVID, but maybe just be aware of the, the chest x-ray. Um, I can tell you at the end what our one COVID question might have been last year. Um, so this again is from the Amnesty. And it's like so random. You wouldn't know this if you didn't go to UCL, um, but you do need to know this. Well, if, if you're going to learn the questions from there, which I would recommend. Uh, it is not amoebiasis. That is a good guess, though. This is a sign, like, if you've seen it, you know what it is. If you've not, you've not. Um, so, like, yeah, we're definitely thinking down the kind of liver inflammation route. Anyone know? Is it like ground glass opacity or something? It is. Um, and do you know what causes that? Hepatitis. Do you know what type of hepatitis? So yeah, these are ground glass hepatocytes. They're just hepatocytes. You can see some of them are like destroyed and supposedly it looks like ground glass. Uh, hep B? Yeah. So it's a chronic hep B infection that causes this. Um, yeah, I've not talked through hepatitis. We can go over that again another time if you want. I think someone might have done already. Um, but just be aware of this random sign. Chronic hep B can cause ground glass hepatocytes. Um, and that was all. Thank you very much, everyone.
Um, oh, I finished bang on time. That's good. I think I normally run over. Um, I'd love some feedback. Like, let me know what you did or didn't like and what else you want in the kind of run up to exams over the next couple months. So you can kind of focus in on what will be most useful for everyone. Let me stop the recording.